We're going to be dealing with a very difficult and emotional subject of divorce today. If you haven't been divorced, someone in your family probably has. The statistics are astonishing, both inside the church and in our society in general. I hope today that I can uh, bring some light to a subject without having to answer all the questions, for I can't do that, for the Bible is silent on many questions we would like to ask. I love divorcees. Every church I've been in, I've started a singles group. I appreciate them. I don't think it's the unpardonable sin, but I think it is a sin. And I want to talk about it from basically three different passages. Uh, I'm going to start in Matthew 19, making allusion to Matthew 5, 31 and 32, and Mark 10, 1 through 12. And if I have time, some allusions to 1 Corinthians 7. I think that uh, this is a r real uh, current topic because our culture is so much like Jesus' day in so many ways. Now, we've got to remember, first of all, that we've got to be careful that our preconceived a priori um, notions, our cultural experience, the flavor of our day, what has happened to us as an individual, doesn't color our understanding of divorce. This is one area where dogmatic rules, unrelated to the situation, is probably very inappropriate. Now, with that in mind, I would like to go to uh, Matthew 19. And I want to say to you that we've got to realize we're not in a neutral text. The most neutral text, if it is neutral, is Jesus' discussion in Matthew 5, 31 and 32 and Mark 10, 11 and 12. Uh, on one, he's, not, he's in a teaching session, the Sermon on the Mount. In the other, he's in a private home answering the disciples' questions. But the rest of these texts, they're trying to trick him. Now, basically, the trick evolved around the two rabbinical schools of Shammai and Hillel. And I think I'm going to wait to discuss them until I get to the text itself. Uh, this, we think this is the Perean ministry of Jesus because he's moving from Galilee to Jerusalem. And usually the Jews did not pass through Samaria because they hated them so badly. They would cross over into Perea, travel down Perea, and cross back over into Jericho. Since Jesus is in the presence of a large number of followers, crowd, possibly on the way to a feast in Jerusalem, uh, we see the setting here as he walks and ministers on the way. I'll begin in verse 3. And some Pharisees came up to him to, to try him out with a question. Now, of course, the Pharisees were the very um, uh, committed, sincere uh, group within Judaism that had tried to build an oral interpretation around the written law to make sure they never broke the law of God. Friends, they had rules and commitment far beyond ours, but they tended to be legalist. They tend to look for loopholes in the written text or oral tradition uh, to justify their lifestyle. They, they try to test him. There are two words for test in Greek. One means to test and is used in the sense for approval, and one word is to test or try to use the sense toward destruction. Uh, it can mean for good or evil, but it's usually used for Satan and men, and because of our propensity toward evil, it's used in a sense of destruction. And that's the word here. They were not really after a theological uh, uh, information. They were trying to alienate Jesus from some segment of his society. Now, this was either one or the two of the rabbinical schools, possibly to make him uh, alienated from a group in society, or possibly to alienate him from Herod, um, who had remarried, and was and he's the one that killed John the Baptist because John preached on this issue. And so you see what they're trying to do. Now, this is probably a good place to go over these two schools. Jesus is going to put them back to Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. That I hope you'll read that because in context, it's not really dealing uh, with the issues the Pharisees are trying to trick him over. Uh, but anyway, they go back to that. Now, in that Deuteronomy 24 passage, one school of rabbis, Shammai, the conservative ones, picked up on uh, the idea of unfaithfulness, okay, uh, which basically was interpreted as adultery. The other group of rabbis, Hillel, picked up on the idea 
uh, find some fault or indecency in her in, in the idea of any any grounds were for divorce. If, if she burnt the toast, if she talked back to your uh, relatives, if she um, uh, nagged, if, if you found a prettier woman, Rabbi Akaba said later, if you found a prettier woman, you could divorce your wife. Now, knowing evilness of men's heart, you know which school was most popular. But it seems that Jesus identified with the school of Shammai here to some extent because in Matthew 5, 31-33 is what's called the um, chastity clause or the idea that the only thing that breaks marriage is not a little piece of paper because a little piece of paper doesn't make marriage, a little piece of paper doesn't break marriage, but unfaithfulness in the sense of extramarital sex. Now, with that being in mind, they're trying to get him to polarize or pick one of these sides. Listen to what Jesus said. Is it right for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? Now, any cause is what uh, Hillel would pick up on. Some indecency is what Shammai would pick up on from, Gen from Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. Now, notice that primarily here they're talking about uh, causes for divorce. Uh, in Matthew 10, I mean, excuse me, Mark 10, particularly 11 and 12, they're going to talk about remarriage. And so it seems to be the same subject, but we're a little bit... Uh, slight different flavor in the two accounts. And he answered, Have you not read that the Creator at the beginning made them male and female? This goes back to Genesis 1.26 where it said he made in the image of God. And then in verse 1.27 it says, Male and female made he them. Okay, male and female are both in the image of God. And united to his wife. Now the word united back from Deuteronomy, excuse me, Genesis 2.24 uh, means to glue, to cleave to. Okay? Um, and the two of them shall become one. Now, it is I don't know how strong you can say something that the norm for men and women is marriage, and the norm is one man, one woman for life. How stronger can you say it than the two become one? The same word for one is used of God in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6, the Jewish prayer known as the Shema. So I think it's real important we see that God's ideal has always been one man, one woman for life. Now, there is the ideal of celibacy. We'll get to that later. It's a spiritual gift. It's for the purpose of ministry. But the norm has been marriage. Now, notice in verse 6. So they are no longer two but one. Therefore, what? Notice not who. It's what. Now, we're talking about the institution of marriage here, not simply an individual case of marriage. For uh, what God has joined, heiress tense, once and for all, together, and the idea here is yoked together. It's a team of oxen that work together, that, that, are, that are coordinated. That's what marriage was meant to be. Uh, man must not separate. Now, here's the idea that God brought marriage into being. God's ideals for men and women to be one in marriage, and men are busting that up. In this context, it's Pharisees over their nitpicking legalism. In other examples, it's uh, the evilness of men's heart, the pressures of society, whatever. God's will is not that men and women in marriage be separated. You can't get around that. The ideal is one man, one woman for life. Divorce is always a problem. It's always a failure. It's always less than what God wants, always. And though we love divorcees, and it is not the unpardonable sin, and grace is present in forgiveness, we must, we must say that God's ideal is one man, one woman for life. Whatever problems come has to be worked at. That's why men and women are so different. But God placed us together for our character building. It's never appropriate to run out. And you say, Bob, what about uh, insanity or drug abuse or all of that? I know there are some occasions where separation is absolutely mandatory. But I don't think the Bible ever gives sanction for divorce without repentance and fresh commitment. Now, notice where it mentions here. And they said to him, what did Moses command us, why did Moses command us to give a, a written divorce charge? Now here's a good example of men proof texting the Bible to make it say what they want to. They would say something like, the Bible said it here, Jesus, how are you getting around that? Here's a good example where proof texting is inappropriate. I've heard all my life, the Bible says it, that settles it. That is not true. If the Bible says it, we take it extremely seriously because it's the word of God. But then we find out what else the Bible says on the same subject. Here Jesus obviously f throws fresh light on the Scripture. He does that in Matthew 5, 17 through 21, where he says, the Word of God will not pass away, but 
they misinterpret it. And he reinterprets murder and adultery. Now listen, friends, we've got to be careful that we don't proof text the scripture and miss the mind of God. That's what the Pharisees did. That's what we do over and over. Now, of course, the idea here is Deuteronomy 24, 1 and following, 1 through 4. I think Moses did it because of the uh, godless way they were living. I think he did it to protect the wife who was being so badly abused. I think he did it to put a boundary on evil. But it was never God's intent. It was a concession and never meant to be a universal principle. Just like uh, 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 polygamy was a concession, not a universal principle. It just happened. But it doesn't mean the Bible advocates it. It records it. It does not advocate it. Now, the reason I think this, this bill of charge was done by Moses, it had to be done by a rabbi. It was kind of a set form. But it took a few days to get done. It was a very official deal. And I think Moses was hoping those few days they would cool off and reconcile. Uh, Deuteronomy 24 is really about what if someone puts a woman away, can he ever be remarried to her? And it says if she remarries someone else, no. So the, the impasse of Deuteronomy 24 is not even the question we're really asking here. And he answered them, It is because of the moral perversity, hardness of heart, that Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But it was not so from the beginning. I tell you, Whoever divorces his wife for any other cause than unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. Now, this is what's called the miseries about remarriage. And I wish I had time to go through the detail. I want to combine with this Matthew chapter 10, uh, beginning in verse 11. Let's see. Yeah, beginning in verse 11, where Jesus talked to the disciples away from the Pharisees. If any man divorces his wife to marry another woman, he commits adultery against his former wife. And if any woman divorces her husband to marry another, she commits adultery. Now, notice that. Uh, watch closely with this. My Williams translation is very interpretive in Mark 10, but it's very important we see what's happening. Williams is interpreting this as if the cause for putting your wife away is to marry another, it's adultery. Now, that's interpretive. That's in many manuscripts. It's not in Alexandrinus. Uh, the purpose is not specified, I think, in the text. Now, notice Mark says a woman can also put her husband away. Matthew writing to Jews, only the man could put his wife away. Mark writing to Gentiles was dealing with a situation where men and women could divorce in the Greek culture, and so he adds both. Now, the verbal forms here are very, very important. Not only the verbal form of Matthew 5, 31 through 33, but the verbal form of Mark 10 is very significant. The, Mark, the Matthew passage is passive. Now, if you know Greek, the forms can mean different things, but the context demands passive, which means that when a man puts his wife away, the woman doesn't have any choice there. He, she is put away. But the fact that she is put away socially stigmatizes her as an adulteress. Okay? Not that she did it, but that since the only real grounds for separation are adultery, and since she is put away by her husband, she is stigmatized an adulterer. And there are any four who marries her is stigmatized an adulterer. Now, here, here in uh, Mark, it's middle. If a man himself chooses to put his wife away, if a woman chooses to put her husband away, the very fact they choose to do so, and here, with improper motives, and Jesus would say it's always with improper motives, they stigmatize the other partner. So I think Mark 10 tells us there is an offended and an offending partner. Now, in my personal opinion, uh, 1 Corinthians 7 is not bound, is not refer to remarriage, but to separation between a people who married as lost people, but one of them is converted. Matthew 7, I mean, 1 Corinthians 7 never gives grounds for a believer marrying a non-believer. I want to tell you the Bible never, never says do that. Matter of fact, I think growing Christians ought to marry growing Christians. Now, this is the idea that there is moral failure involved in breaking up a marriage on somebody's part. And I'm smart enough to know that it takes two to tango, and there's two parties involved in a divorce, as well as a marriage. Marriage is an ongoing thing. You have to work at it all the time. There is moral failure on both parts. But I also know from counseling, and seemingly from Mark 10, 11 and 12, that there is an active, aggressive party in divorce, and quite often a passive party. Now, let me go back, if I could, to the Matthew uh, 19 passage, okay? Now, this unfaithless and marriage another woman commits adultery. Now, I think that means that they're stigmatized because of the verbal form. I do not believe that remarriage is automatically adultery. 
You saying, Bob, are you allowing remarriage? It's obvious that Moses allowed remarriage. I think uh, Bob Thiem and Baraka Church is very dogmatic about allowing remarriage. Bill Gothard is very dogmatic about not allowing remarriage. I think we've got to be careful here of dogmatism. It seems to me because of Mark 10, 11 and 12, that remarriage is appropriate for the offended party. I don't believe that divorce is a sin uh, that will mark you for the rest of your life as having to be single. I do think that because of 1 Timothy 3, uh, 1 through about 12, that divorce and remarriage may disqualify a, a person from some places of leadership in the church. I'm not saying they're less spiritual. I'm not saying all of us don't sin. I'm saying that because in uh, 1 Timothy 3, the word no handle for criticism is used over and over for leaders, and it means no handle for criticism within the church or from the unbelieving community, that any failure in the home, be it children, be it wife, be it money, be it drunkenness, any failure in the home disqualifies one from being a leader of a church. You say, Bob, what if they were lost and did this, and then they were saved? I think we have to take that into account. I think lostness can't count against us forever. Uh, what about the fact that they're already in the ministry and they get divorced? Boy, I don't think the Bible specifically teaches them that, but I want to say this. I think that probably would disqualify someone from continuing. You say, boy, you're a hard and fast rule person. I'm really not. When people come to me and say, Bob, do you believe the Bible teaches remarriage? I have to say, I'm not sure. If they come in and say, Bob, would you remarry us? We've both been divorced or one's been divorced. We want a Christian home. We've asked God to forgive us. We're looking for a new day of service. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I'd be happy to. For you see, I take people over rules. But I also take the Bible very, very seriously. And the words of Jesus must shout in our ears that our culture is so perverse that we feel like marriage is like a new pair of shoes. If it doesn't fit, get another shoe. Divorce is such a problem in the church and without the church that we need godly leaders who have not been touched by this, who can witness and minister. We need more than anything to have attractive homes. It'll attract more folks to Christ than almost anything else we can do in our day. But God help us. The church is affected in its uh, uh, understanding and structure society. So often the church follows society instead of following the Bible. This is what Jesus says. The disciples said to him, what if a man's relation to his wife, there is no advantage in getting married? The disciples were knocked off their feet by what Jesus said. They couldn't believe it. And Jesus goes into discussion in 11 and 12 about celibacy. He says, if you can't handle this, you probably shouldn't marry. Wow. Now what we're saying is, if you can't enter into this with a lifelong commitment, whatever it takes in Jesus' name, you probably ought not go into it at all. Now celibacy is a gift from God. Uh, it, it is a gift primarily focused towards service, okay? We, we stay single for the glory of God, not because we're just hard to live with or got two stinking idiosyncrasies, nobody wants us, or we're too uh, ugly or something. No, that's not it at all. It's service for God. Now, listen to me. If we look down the road and count the cost and say, I don't think I can hang in there, we probably ought to marry. If we desire to be married and we're willing to work at it, then I think it's appropriate. Marriage is the norm. Celibacy is not a higher spiritual plane. Listen to me now. When we make a commitment in Jesus' name to someone else to love and honor and cherish them the rest of our lives, friends, that is a serious vow in Jesus' name. It's a serious thing to break a vow. I think the marriage relationship is what God uses over and over in the Bible to describe the relationship between him and people. So I think it's a very important commitment we make. It's a commitment that has tensions in it. All marriages have tensions because men and women are different. But the, the reason God made us so different is that we could work together in forgiveness and love and faith and, and all of that and learn the qualities that God wants us to, not only in marriage, but with him. And so when we keep jumping out of marriage, we think there's an ideal marriage. There is no ideal marriages. There is not a better person out there. This idea of, boy, I can have greater sex with someone else or greater joy with someone else or no problem with someone else, is it just a lie from the devil? There's always problems in relationship between men and women, and we need to work through them. Now, in saying that, those who've experienced divorce for whatever reasons, I want to say that God loves you and has a plan for your life, 
and you're not cut off from the church, you're not cut off from some forms of leadership. I think you're cut off from some because of 1 Timothy 3. But I think you're not cut off from service, meaningful service to God. In my church, I used to let divorcees have place of responsibility in the Sunday school. I used to call them to pray often. I used to invite them to teach courses on different subjects, uh, invite them to share their testimony. I had a real problem with a divorced deacon. I don't have a problem with a single deacon. I have a real problem with a divorced uh, minister. I don't have a problem with a single minister. I don't think that singles are marred for life morally, but I think we must take the scripture seriously. You say, Bob, what do you think Jesus was saying about divorce? I think Jesus was saying that God has a plan for man sexually. That plan is marriage, monogamous marriage. There are exceptions. The gift of celibacy, singleness, is an exception. Divorce is a reality we must face, an ancient reality, a current reality. In my opinion, Jesus' day is not so much different than our day. The rabbis, being evil, tried to find, quote, proof text to allow men to have as many wives as they want for any reason. God help us, we're still doing that. We're still doing that. There is a witness in the way our homes are structured and perform. Divorce is a moral failure. It needs to be forgiven, and life needs to be got on with. It amazed me how many folks come off and say, Bob, uh, uh, what about this? They usually want my blessing on the way to the divorce court. They're not really willing to work at it. They just want to say it's all right from the preacher. It's not all right. Listen to me. It's never all right. It's always a problem. It's always a sin. Now, it's not the unpardonable sin, and God will forgive, and life ca can be meaningful, but it's a problem. And we in the church need to hold up the ideal, both in theology from the book and in practice in our lives. I am not a moralistic, judgmental person. I know that sometimes situations are such that it's impossible for a couple to stay together. I know that. I know that. So I want to say to you again, I really believe there is an offended and an offending party. Personally, I think remarriage is conditioned on which one you are. I wish I had some more guidelines. I wish I could call Jesus on the red phone and say, Jesus, could you help me a little more in this area? He's given us some things we must act on. He has never sat down and given us a complete theology about many issues that we face. In my ministry, I have chosen to deal with people who sincerely want to be godly. I have chosen to participate with individuals who have fallen short, as all of us have but I want to take seriously the Word of God. I want to hold up the ought and minister to the is. I want to affirm the ideal and deal with reality. We've got to do that. I hope you'll get some books on divorce. One of the better books that I know of that deals with the Journal of Psychology and Theology from Rosemead has some great articles. I think commentators on Matthew 5, 31 and following, Matthew 19, 1 through 12, Mark 10, 1 through 12, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 15, right through there, will be very, very helpful as you struggle through this. If you haven't been touched by divorce, you probably will. The church is a peculiar people, a holy race, a called nation. We are to be different. We're to be different in every area of our life, what we think how we uh, do our recreation, how our marriages deal, how our, 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 our dating deals, how we speak, our priorities. Everything ought to be different about us. This is true in this area. We need more premarital counseling. We need to talk to our kids that we need to marry growing believers. We need to prioritize Jesus. We need to be active in the church. We need to do some preventive medicine in this area. We're going with the flow of culture instead of the dictates of Scripture. 
The church does not need to be legalistic, but she needs to be biblical. She needs to minister in forgiveness, but she needs to take seriously the words of Jesus. Divorce is out of the will of God. Divorce is a reality. Divorce is a sin. It's not a bigger sin or a less sin than any other sin. It breaks the fellowship and barrier and puts up barriers between God and man. It can be dealt with in repentance and faith. All of us have problems. All of us are sinners. If we could just love one another, minister to one another, hold up the role models that are biblical, and show both in role models that are healthy and how we deal with role models that are sick, that we are the people of God. I think it'll be a brand new day. If you disagree with what I said, I hope you'll read the scriptures, pray about it, and study. Don't lock down on me or Bob Theme or Bill Gothard. Lock down the Bible as, in, as interpreted by the Holy Spirit. Live up to the light you have. That's all you can do. You can't live up to my light or anybody else's light. Find out in the Scripture what you believe and then act in love and faith on that. And I think God will be pleased when we see him. I've enjoyed being with you. I'll see you again. Same time, same place next week. God bless you.